It is good to be with you to study together again tonight. I hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far. I hope to see you on Sunday, this coming Sunday, either at 9 or at 10.30 a.m. And if you can join us at one of those two services, I hope you can sign up online using the Sign Up Genius account. And that helps us keep track of who's coming, so we make sure we don't all uh, come to one service and not the other. Helps us to split it up a little bit uh, more evenly. If you don't have internet access, if you need any help with the sign-up process, get in touch either with me or with Kenna. We'd love to help you through that. Uh, tonight, we continue with our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, is a book that explains the history of the early church, and it's written by Luke, a medical doctor, to a man by the name of Theophilus, and it covers a period of time from roughly 30 until 60 AD. So the book of Luke is volume one, dealing with the life of Christ, covering those 30 years from his birth to his crucifixion. And then the book of Acts continues on from the Lord's ascension until partway through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, up to this point in the book, we have looked at the first eight chapters, and we are using the ABCs of Acts to try to help us keep track of things. It's a good memory tool. It's something that I've learned uh, learned many years ago, probably in the mid-80s, when I took my dad's class on Acts in the middle school, high school class down at the church in Crystal Lake, Illinois, and I've remembered it ever since then. But if you're following along in the ABCs of Acts, we summarize chapter one with the word ascension, referring to the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. In chapter 2, we had the beginning of the church. In Acts chapter 3, we saw a man carried by his friends and left at the temple gates. He's healed by Peter and John, and so the summary is carried and cured. That's what happens in chapter 3. In chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested. They are threatened by the council to stop preaching about Jesus, but they are determined disciples, and so they continue preaching regardless or in spite of those threats. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail as Peter and some of the other apostles are arrested. They are then let out of jail by the angel and they go right back to preaching. So empty jail for chapter 5. We summarize chapter 6 with the words first deacons, but always with the question mark. Uh, seven men were appointed to coordinate the feeding of the Greek-speaking widows, and they seem to be doing the work that deacons would normally do, but they're never directly called deacons in the official sense of that word, but first deacons with a question mark. In Acts chapter 7, we had uh, Stephen, one of those servants, stoned to death for preaching, and so he is a great hero. And then in Acts chapter 8, over the last couple of weeks, we've learned about Philip uh, preaching and baptizing people up in Samaria before he was then called by God to preach to the Ethiopian eunuch along the road in the wilderness. And you may remember he asked the man, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And then after preaching Jesus, Philip baptizes the eunuch right there by the side of the road. Tonight we get to Acts chapter 9 and the conversion of Saul. In the ABCs of Acts, we summarize Acts 9 with the phrase, I am Jesus. And we'll get to that in just a moment. And as usual, if you can think of something better than I am Jesus to summarize chapter 8, or uh, chapter 9 rather, I hope you'll get in touch and I'd be glad to share that in the next class. But let's start tonight. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Acts 9, verses 1 through 9. We'll also have it on the screen there if you're able to see that. I know some of you are joining us on the phone. Others are joining us on YouTube or through Facebook link. But let's look at Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Acts 9, 1 through 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Well, here at the beginning of Acts chapter 9, we are reintroduced to this man by the name of Saul. And by way of review, Saul was the young man described as holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen at the end of chapter 7. If you want to review that, feel free. And Saul is the one who takes it upon himself to then coordinate a widespread persecution of the church in the opening verses of chapter 8. And it was this 
persecution that caused the early Christians to flee from Jerusalem. They ran in all directions, uh, preaching the gospel as they scattered. We then had the two updates over the last couple weeks from Philip uh, preaching to the Samaritans and then preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch there in the wilderness along the road. And now we finally get back to Saul. So those things have kind of happened in the meantime. And we find here that as Philip has been preaching, Saul has continued persecuting. So meanwhile, uh, elsewhere, this is what Saul has been doing. As Luke puts it, Saul is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So this is Saul's life. He lives to terrorize the Lord's church and the Lord's people. He's breathing threats and murder against the disciples. It's almost as if everything he says is a threat. He lives, breathes, thinks, eats, everything he does uh, seems to be focused on persecuting the Lord's church. And so he seems to be almost obsessed with this, obsessed with exterminating uh, the Lord's church. He's motivated by righteous anger. And I think I think of what Jesus said uh, to the apostles back in John 16, 2 and 3, when he gave them this warning ahead of time, referring to those who would persecute the church. He said, they will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. And again, that was from Jesus himself on the night before he was uh, crucified himself. Just a few things from that passage there. Um, in John chapter 16, Paul clearly thinks that he is offering service to God, doesn't he? This is righteous anger. He thinks that he's pleasing to God. He thinks that he's doing the Lord's work. And so he is incredibly motivated. But we should also note how Jesus says he's doing this along with others because they have not known either the Father or me. And so Saul, a righteous Jew, at least the way he was looked at by his peers, he seems to be described by Jesus as not knowing either the Father or or Jesus the Messiah himself. If we were to ask Saul at this point whether he knew the Father, I'm pretty sure that he would say, yes, of course I do. I know the Father. He's my Father in heaven and all that. And yet Jesus says here that he doesn't. And we learn from this what we feel, what we think we know, might not actually be the truth. And so we need to be extremely careful then to constantly compare what we believe to what the scriptures actually teach. You know, it's possible Saul could have studied himself out of this, as we say, if he had been open to it, and yet Saul was extremely stubborn. He was stuck in his ways, he believed what he believed, and he was not interested in changing. I think of what Saul would write later in 1 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14, when he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me, because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And so Paul, or Saul himself, was finally able to look back on his former life, and he was able to describe himself many years later as having previously acted ignorantly and in unbelief. Here he was, a, a highly educated man, a teacher of the law, a rabbi himself, and yet he did not know what he did not know. And that ignorance caused him to actually blaspheme God or speak against God. It also caused him to be a violent aggressor, which obviously violates the second greatest commandment, that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. At the end of verse 1, we find Saul actually went to the high priest, and in verse 2, we find that he asked for letters so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, he could drag them back to Jerusalem. And so Saul then is working with the Jewish leadership, and it seems as if they give him some kind of arrest warrants, we might say. They give him these pieces of paper, giving him authority to travel from city to city, arresting people along the way, anybody who believed in the Lord Jesus. Uh, remember, the disciples have not yet been called Christians. That doesn't even come until later in the book of Acts, Acts 11:26, uh, I believe. And so they're described here simply as belonging to the way. Interesting way to refer to the church, the way. Uh, remember how Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we have a number of references throughout the New Testament of 
the early church being described as the way. So this means that we belong to the way, doesn't it? And uh, this is one of several ways we refer to the Lord's church. Uh, sometimes we refer to the Lord's church as the nameless church. Uh, the Lord's church, as I understand it, does not have a formal proper name. It is described in scripture as the way. It is described as being the church of God, the church of the firstborn, God's building, God's family, the body of Christ. And when spoken of collectively, we are described as the churches of Christ. Um, but these are not so much titles as they are descriptions. The church does not have a formal title or a formal name, but it has a number of descriptions with each description uh, focusing on a different aspect of the church itself. And I just say this because this is an interesting way of describing it. Uh, he was looking for people who uh, claimed to belong to the way. Uh, notice Paul did not discriminate, did he, based on gender. It didn't matter whether they were men or women. Paul didn't care. Man or woman, if you believed in Jesus of Nazareth, Saul was after you. And if Saul found someone belonging to the way, his goal was to bring them bound to Jerusalem. We're not told in this passage, but what do we think the goal is here? What do you think happened to these people when Paul brought them or when Saul brought them bound to Jerusalem? Personally, I'm thinking the goal is to do to each one of these people what they did to Stephen. Stone them to death for blasphemy, for turning away from the one and true way as they saw it. They saw them as leaving uh, Judaism, perhaps. And again, we're not told what they did to these people once they were bought, brought to Jerusalem, but we're told from other passages and from here that Saul was pre previously a violent aggressor. He seems to have almost enjoyed uh, doing some terrible things to people, thinking that he was offering service to God. So not a lot of details, I guess I should say, in this passage, uh, but we do fill in some of those blanks later from Paul's own writing. Um, Saul then is traveling far and wide to find these people belonging to the way. And as he's traveling on the road to Damascus, he is stopped in his tracks by a bright light. And he falls down to the ground. He hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul obviously wants to know, who are you, Lord? Now, Saul's use of the word Lord has always been interesting to me. He doesn't know who this person is who's talking to him, but he knows that he's Lord. And the word Lord in this passage is not necessarily implying deity of some kind, but it simply refers to Lord as master. Um, some would compare this term to the word sir today. We're not talking to deity, but if we use the word sir, we're talking to somebody in a position of authority, someone with some uh, power perhaps over us, and so this is Lord, not in a religious or deity type sense that uh, Saul uses this term, uh, but Lord is used more in a generic sense, we might say here. The word simply means uh, Lord, Master, or again, Sir, as we might say today. And this is where we get the Lord's reply. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So this is where we get the I in the ABCs of Acts. I am Jesus. And that's how we remember what's going on in chapter 9. Uh, Jesus confronts Saul for persecuting the church. Um, but now that I mention that, let's notice who it is Saul is persecuting. By persecuting the way, Saul is actually persecuting the Lord himself. Remember, the church is the Lord's body. We learn this in the books of Colossians and Ephesians that are not going to come along until a number of years later. But I think we learn from that that if someone mistreats the church, that person is also mistreating the Lord himself. And the Lord takes that personally. Why are you persecuting me? Um, Saul didn't think that he was persecuting Jesus the Messiah. And yet, ultimately, he was. As a very practical reminder, kind of the so what, what does this mean for us? Um, I think we need to keep this in mind when we talk about the church in general. Um, I know I've heard people talk about you know broad statements like, uh, the church never does this, or the church always does this, kind of some broad generalization that's somewhat negative. The church never teaches on grace, or the church isn't loving, or uh, any number of things like that. But let's also remember that when we do that, we're talking about the Lord's bride. We're talking about the Lord's own body. And if somebody talked about my wife, like some people talk about the Lord's church, um, I'd be pretty angry, and I think many of us would if somebody talked like that about somebody that we knew and loved. And so 
I know even preachers can get caught up like this in this way. And, and when I hear that, the church is always this way or always that way or never does this in some negative sense. Um, it, my practice has been, at least always, if I have the opportunity, I try to ask, you know, how do you know this? Um, do you know that all churches are like this? And, and do you really know uh, what we're doing or what we're not doing in the Lord's Church in Madison, Wisconsin? Because chances are uh, they don't. And so if somebody says, the church never teaches on grace, well, do you know what we studied last week at the Four Lakes Congregation? Probably not. And so I'm just saying we need to be very careful about how we talk about the Lord's body or the Lord's bride in general. Uh, but this is something we learn here. To mistreat the church is to mistreat the Lord himself. And so Jesus then confronts Saul over what he's doing. Remember, Saul is on the road to Damascus to bind people, to arrest them, and to then bring them back to Jerusalem. In verse 6, uh, Jesus tells Saul to get up and to enter the city. And once you're there, it'll be told you what you must do. If you remember last week when we studied the Ethiopian eunuch, we learned that God never tells people what to do to be saved directly. Angels don't do that either. But sometimes God arranges the meeting between the person who needs to know and somebody who is willing to tell. Preaching the gospel is our job. God never tells people directly what they need to do to be saved. But instead, um, the Lord told Saul where he needed to go to meet somebody who was willing to tell him. In the same way, Jesus doesn't tell Saul what to do, but he tells him where to go. And that's what we learn from this, that sometimes we are the ones who have that responsibility to teach. In verse 7, we find for the very first time that Saul has associates. I don't think we learned this earlier in this chapter. And so he's not out there doing this on his own, but he has his own little persecution squad going on here. And these men hear the voice, they don't see anybody, they don't see the Lord themselves, but they can clearly hear something. Um, as Saul retells this in his own words later in Acts 22, he says that the men with him do not understand the voice. And so they hear something, some kind of maybe thunderous noise, but they're not able to understand the words that are spoken. So Saul is the only one who actually hears and understands what the Lord is saying here. In verse 8, he gets up, but he's blind. His eyes are open, but he can't see anything. The men with him then lead him by the hand and bring him to Damascus. Imagine how humiliating this must have been for a man like Saul. He's this up-and-coming religious leader. Uh, these men are obviously working for him. Saul is the one in charge of this little mission. Uh, but now these men uh, are the ones leading him by the hand into the city of Damascus. Yesterday afternoon, I was wondering how far it is from Jerusalem to Damascus, and so I looked it up on Google Maps, and you can type in if you want to fly or drive or take public transportation or walk or bike, and so I typed in there, uh, Jerusalem, Israel to Damascus, Syria. I put in, I want to do this trip on foot. <laughs> Google threw up a few warnings at me. You really do not want to walk from Jerusalem uh, up to Damascus these days. There are some issues between those two locations, but nevertheless, they gave a distance, if you really want to make that trip, of 178 miles. So 178 miles from Jerusalem to Damascus. Google estimates that to take 59 hours on foot. If you were just to walk straight through without stopping, that trip would take 59 hours. And then I started wondering, to put this in perspective, to make this figure we could understand, I was kind of wondering, what city in Wisconsin is 178 miles from Madison. What city in Wisconsin is 178 miles from Madison? I don't know if you can guess uh, what cities are 178 miles from us here in Madison. My first guess was Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And so I typed that in, Madison to Eau Claire, Wisconsin on foot. And wouldn't you know it, that trip is exactly 178 miles. Um, what are the chances of uh, getting that right on the first guess? I guess I've made a few trips to Eau Claire uh, in my life, and uh, I guess we've been here long enough. But imagine walking from Madison to Eau Claire simply to harass some kind of religious group and to arrest them and then bring them back. That is what Saul is doing, and now he is blind and now he has to be led by the hand into the city just to be wait 
uh, just to wait to be told what to do. So he goes from being in charge of leading this effort to basically depending on others to get him where he needs to go. I'm also guessing that Saul wasn't accustomed to being told to wait. He seems to be a get it done, be in charge kind of guy. And here he is. Go to the city and wait, and then you'll be told what you must do. So there's the wait, and then there's also the command um, that there's something that he's going to have to do. Once he's in Damascus, though, he waits, uh, and he goes three days, neither eating nor drinking. And here is one of a number of examples of fasting in the Bible. Um, notice it wasn't commanded in this case. God didn't say to Saul, thou shalt go three days without food or water. This is nothing that was commanded of Saul. But rather, this is Saul's natural reaction to what has happened here. He's obviously upset. He's obviously uh, thinking about the Lord's message, pondering those words, uh, running through that vision in his mind over and over and over again. I'm wondering... Uh, what he's thinking about the death of Stephen. Uh, if I were Saul in this situation, I'd be thinking back about that sermon. And I'd be thinking, this man Stephen was probably right in everything that he said about the religious leaders through the years being stubborn and obstinate and disobeying and, and persecuting God's prophets. And he's probably saying, that's me. I'm, I'm guilty of that. But we're not told what he was thinking for those three days. He's obviously upset, thinking about what the Lord has said. And just in, as a natural response to that, that heavy grief, it seems that he just stops eating and drinking. Sometimes when something happens to us like that, we're just overwhelmed with emotion and we just can't. And so he does that for three days. In verse 11, we will also find that he is praying. So we're not told that here. We're going to find it later that God hears his prayer. Sometimes God wonders, sometimes people wonder whether God hears the prayers of those who are not yet Christians. I think this is an example, one of a couple in the Bible I can think of, where yes, he does. God knows that Saul is praying, uh, even though he has not yet obeyed the gospel at this point. Now, at this point, many people in the religious world would say that Saul is good to go. A lot of people today in the religious world would say, well, Saul is probably saved now. They'll, they'll say, um, if you have a vision of Jesus, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty cool. If you, if you see Jesus and if you pray and fast for three days, um, that should get you into heaven. I mean, that'll, that'll stamp your ticket on the express line to get into heaven, right? If you've seen Jesus and you've fasted for three days and you've prayed for three days, and yet I would just point out that is not where we are in this account quite yet. Instead, Saul hasn't even been told what to do yet. Remember, Jesus said, go and wait, and there you will be told what you must do. So we're not even yet to the do part uh, in this message quite yet. I know some churches today will get mad if we uh, suggest that we need to do anything to be saved. Do? What do you mean? We're saved by grace or faith only? You don't need to do anything, some religious groups will teach. And yet... Um, this is what Saul's waiting for. He's waiting to be told what to do. Uh, by the way, some churches will even refer to Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Saul was converted on the road to Damascus, they will say. Uh, we have a church here in Madison known as the Damascus Road Church. And that, I believe, refers to the idea that Saul was saved or converted on the road to Damascus. And so we want to do what he did on the road to Damascus. Um, but was Saul really converted on the road to Damascus? No, no, he was not. In fact, if the chapter ended right here, Saul would still be lost in his sins. His sins have not yet been forgiven at this point. But thankfully, though, this account continues. And so we pick up tonight with the second half of this section that we're in tonight, Acts 9, verses 10 through 19. And I put 19a because the verse kind of gets split right in the middle there. If you have a, your Bible open, you may notice that. A lot of our Bibles put a paragraph mark right in the middle of verse 19. So anyway, Acts 9, verses 10 through the first part of verse 19. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, 
and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name? But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. In the first part of this, we're introduced to a man by the name of Ananias. Many years ago, I preached on this passage, and I referred to the preacher Ananias, that God got the preacher Ananias to go talk to Saul. But someone pulled me aside after the lesson, and this man said, Did you know that Ananias is never referred to in the Bible as being a preacher? Well, I'm thinking there in my mind after church that uh, that Sunday evening as I remember it. No, this guy's got to be wrong. Certainly, certainly Ananias is called a preacher. I mean, after all, I just called him a preacher, right? And uh, and yet, I, and I was pretty sure they were wrong, but I looked into it. And sure enough, Ananias is never referred to in the Bible as being a preacher. But instead, he's simply referred to as a disciple, a certain disciple. And of course, I guess the question is, so what? What does that mean for us? Well, I think there is a practical lesson here. You don't need to be a preacher to go tell someone what they need to do to be saved. If you are a disciple, if you are a Christian, you already know what someone else needs to do because you've read it in the Word of God and you've already done it yourself. <laughs> And so you know, based on the inspiration of the scriptures and also by personal experience, have you personally heard the good news? Have you believed it? Have you turned away from your sins? Have you confessed Jesus as the Son of God? Have you ever been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? If so, if that's true of you, that's what we need to tell others. Now, God could have very easily sent an apostle. God could have sent Peter. God could have sent John to go talk to Saul. God could have sent Philip. Philip's pretty good at being sent all over the place to teach people the gospel. God could have sent a preacher. But instead, I just want to point out here that God sent Ananias, a disciple of the Lord. Anybody can do this. We can do this. All we need to do is to be willing to share what we know. And Ananias was willing, at least at first. Notice... The Lord calls his name and he answers, Here I am, Lord. Uh, this, by the way, was how Eli told Samuel to respond to the Lord when he was first called in the temple in 1 Samuel 3. Remember? Uh, when he heard the voice, you know, what do I do? Well, just say, Here I am, Lord. And of course, he does that. Uh, this is also pretty much Isaiah's response when he was called by the Lord back in Isaiah chapter 6. Here am I, send me, he says. Anyway, in verse 11, God gives him the mission. I want you to go to the street called Straight. And I want you to ask at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. And this is where we learn that Saul is praying. Again, we weren't told that earlier, but we find this now after the fact. And I would ask, what do you think Saul's praying for at this point? What are these prayers? Well, what is he saying to God? We aren't told, are we? What would I be praying for if I were struck blind and reprimanded by the Lord himself? for what I was doing. What would I be praying for? I think I'd be begging for forgiveness. I'd be asking what I need to do, kind of like the men in the, on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, what shall we do? We murdered the Lord. What do we need to do? I'd be asking to see again. I kind of like being able to see. Most of us do. Maybe that's what Saul is doing. Again, we're not told, but we are told that in response to Saul's prayer, God is preparing to send a disciple. I almost said preacher in response to his prayer. He almost sent a preacher, but again, not a preacher, just a disciple. Caught myself there. But I think the point is God is preparing to answer Saul's praying 
by sending Ananias, a disciple who's willing and able to step in and explain what he needs to do. And the Lord's message to Ananias is, he knows you're coming. Saul has seen this happen in a vision. He has seen Ananias come and lay his hands on him so he can see again. A few weeks ago, we learned that there are a number of reasons for the laying on of hands, and healing is one of several. And this is what Saul sees in his vision. He sees even when he cannot see. And so this is the mission that Ananias is given. Uh, this, however, is where we see some resistance because Ananias knows who this man is. I think as soon as he hears the word Saul, oh no, you know, Saul, this man has a reputation for doing some terrible things to the Lord's church. And uh, notice the reference to saints in Jerusalem. Uh, the Catholic Church teaches that saints have to, you know, have verified miracles. They have to be dead. They have to be voted on. A number of qualifications for sainthood, but there's none of that here. A saint is somebody who's been set aside for a special purpose. That, that's a term that applies now to all of us as the Lord's people. But anyway, Saul has a reputation for doing some terrible things. And he also seems to know that he's in Damascus with the authority of the chief priests for the purpose of arresting any who call on the Lord's name. And so Ananias knows this. They've been tipped off. They know Saul is on his way. Ananias is aware. And now that the Lord orders him to do this, Ananias is hesitant to say the least. Now, here's a thought question. How scared of Saul would you need to be to actually argue with the Lord? as Ananias does here. I'd like to think that I'd be more scared of the Lord than of Saul, right? But Ananias seems to be pretty terrified of Saul, even to the point of questioning the Lord here. Lord, don't you know who this man is? I'm just paraphrasing there, but are you sure? Do you really want me to do this kind of attitude? The Lord, though, explains, and the Lord says, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So God has big plans for Saul. From a purely human point of view, it almost doesn't make sense to take a highly educated Jewish religious leader and to send him to the Gentiles. If it were me, I might send Saul back to the Sanhedrin. Your mission now is to go convert your people. Go back to these people who respect you, certainly not the Gentiles. And yet when we think about it, and as we see it unfold, I think we understand what God is doing here. In a sense, the Gentiles had to be brought up to speed a bit. The Gentiles had to learn the Hebrew Bible. The Gentiles had to learn about Adam and Moses and David and the prophets and the Psalms and everything else. And who better to do that than Saul? Saul then would be sent to the Gentiles, not primarily the Jewish people, but primarily to the Gentiles. And to me, it's interesting how God is, is saying this even before Saul has even heard the good news. Saul hasn't even been told what to do yet. But somehow God seems to know uh, what's in store for this man. Remember, what we have here is God explaining to Ananias why he needs to go and talk to Saul. Not only would Saul take the gospel to the Gentiles, but he would also take it to kings. And this is what happens, as Saul does eventually take the gospel to governors Felix and Festus, and eventually all the way to Rome, all the way to Caesar's household. And then finally, Saul would also take the Lord's name to the sons of Israel. And so he would take it uh, to the Jewish people as well, at least to any who were willing to listen. And what's, going, uh, what's behind some of this is God showing Saul how much he must suffer for the Lord's name's sake. And at first, I thought this was God almost causing Saul to suffer in order to teach him a lesson, you persecuted my people, I'll make you pay for that kind of thing. But thinking about it a bit more, this may not be what's going on here. I checked the message, a paraphrase of this verse, and the author has God saying, and now I'm about to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes along with this job. And that seems to be what's behind what God is saying here. Saul is about to learn that being a Christian is difficult. There is some suffering involved. I looked up the word suffer in this verse, and that word is used most often to refer to Jesus and his suffering. Saul then will perhaps start to understand personally some of what the Lord suffered as he personally now suffers in the Lord's name. In verse 17, Ananias obeys, 
and goes and he talks to Saul. He lays his hands on him. Again, the purpose for laying on hands in this case is healing. And along with the healing comes a message. Jesus sent me to you. This healing is about to confirm the message. This is the main purpose for miracles in the early church. Not to just impress people, not just to make people feel better, but the purpose is to confirm the word of God. And so the miracle always came with a message. And notice Saul knows Ananias has been sent by God because Ananias knows about Saul's vision. Saul doesn't tell Ananias about the vision, but Ananias tells Saul about the vision. Imagine somebody telling you about a dream you had last night. There's no way Ananias could have known this unless he had in fact been sent by God. So that's part of the miracle here. And the purpose of the meeting between Ananias and Saul that day was so that Saul could see and so that he could be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately at this moment, Saul regains his sight and he gets up and is baptized. He then eats and is strengthened. Uh, this is all we're told in this account. I would point out the order. He's able to see, he gets up and is baptized, and then eats and is strengthened. He doesn't eat until after he's been baptized. That's how urgent baptism was. It, he doesn't eat and then get baptized when he feels like it later. Um, but this is something he does immediately, even before eating, even if he hadn't been eating for three days. Um, but this is all we're told in this account. Later in Acts 22, Paul will, or Saul, Paul, <laughs> Saul now, Paul later will tell this story uh, in different words, but the same story, no contradictions at all. He'll tell it to a Jewish mob in Jerusalem. And this is what happens in his own words. I don't have it on the screen here, but I'm just going to read his account of him retelling this a number of years later in Acts 22, 12 through 16. He says this, A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time, I looked up at him, and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will, and to see the righteous one, and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. A few new details here from this other account. We find that Ananias has a good reputation. We just didn't have that information in chapter 9. We find that Ananias prepares Saul to hear some new information from the Lord. So there's something else coming. You're going to meet the Lord and get some face-to-face -face revelation here a little bit later. And then also notice we have Ananias' command to get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And so we learn here that baptism then is the point at which our sins are washed away. And it is described as how we call on the Lord's name. As Peter will explain later in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism is our appeal to God for a good conscience. Baptism is how we call out to God for forgiveness. And so tonight then, we've looked at Paul's conversion, Saul's conversion. Uh, not on the road to Damascus. That's not where he was converted. That is perhaps where it started. That's where he started thinking thoughts of repentance. But the actual conversion happens at a house on Straight Street in Damascus, where he is baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. And this is a really good place for us to pause for tonight. I see we're about 38 minutes in or so. Uh, next week, let's pick up with the rest of Acts 9, and we'll start in Acts 9, 19, halfway through the verse. We stop partway through verse 19 tonight, so we'll pick up with Acts 9, 19b, we might say. And next week, we'll look at the rest of chapter 9 as Saul tries to get plugged into the church in Jerusalem. They're obviously skeptical uh, after what he's been doing to them lately. Um, you may want to read ahead. You may want to be looking for any other way to summarize chapter 9 with the letter I. Uh, but for now, we're going with I am Jesus, the Lord's reply when Saul wants to know, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. That's what happens in chapter 9. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I want to see you on... Sunday, the Lord's Day for worship, it is the most important thing that we can do on a weekly basis is be together to learn from his word and to sing and to pray and to partake of the Lord's Supper and to give and most importantly to encourage each other uh, to stay strong as we see the great day coming closer. Uh, this Sunday, this coming Sunday will be our last time to just have two services back to back. Because in a week and a half, not this Sunday, but the Sunday after next Sunday, on July 4th, 
we plan on adding a Bible class in between those two services. So in a week and a half, we'll have 9 o'clock early worship, 10 o'clock Bible class, 11 o'clock late worship. Uh, this Sunday, though, we'll still just have two, 9 and 1030. So this would be a great time to sign up online. If you haven't done that already, let me know if I can help. Let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we are in awe of your plan for saving Saul, and we're amazed at the change that we've seen in his life. Thank you for Jesus, and thank you for saving us from our sins, just as you saved him. We're thankful for your kingdom, the church, and we thank you for making us a part of it. We pray that we would encourage each other as we should. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior and our King. Amen.